Hey guys, Chris here with the Good Old Gamer. Today we're going to talk about Ryzen, specifically the Ryzen 5 CPUs that just released yesterday and what impact that this really has on the overall market. Now, for most of us, in the gaming community at least, the Ryzen 5s have been the most interesting CPUs from AMD since we kind of found out about them. Now, before Ryzen launched, there was a lot of speculation. Would there be, you know, uh, an 8-core, 8-thread CPU? Would there be a 6-core, six 6-thread six CPU? And a few weeks ago, we got the answer when AMD released this image right here, uh, which clearly states 6 cores, 12 threads, two different variants, the 1600 and the 1600X, and 4-core, 8-thread CPUs, um, and their pricing. And once we got this information, we really kind of had a good idea of what to expect here. Now, using the R7 CPUs, we were kind of able to extrapolate, not me specifically, but there were many uh, articles out there extrapolating the performance of what the R5 would be. But without actually seeing it in practice, you know, who knows what was actually going to happen. First things first, I'm not going to deep dive into a lot of the benchmarks that are out there because I went through several different websites. I went through a non-tech TechSpot, Tech Power Up, Guru 3D, and Gamers Nexus. Okay, so I used those five websites and kind of tried to compare benchmarks. And one of the weird things that I noticed is, compared to the R7 review, many of these websites scaled back on their gaming section. Now, as gamers, clearly this is what's more interesting to us than, let's say, Cinebench. Okay, overall, that's an important benchmark, but for us, it doesn't really matter. For today's conversation, I'm going to shorten things up and just say I'm going to ignore the R5, 1500X, and 1400. In all honesty, these are not compelling products. They're not much different than what Intel currently offers. Yes, they are less expensive, but at the same time, there's nothing really new here. The really interesting part is the 1600 and the 1600X. Six-core, 12-thread CPUs at $220 and $250, respectively. This is brand new. The $200 segment has not had a refresh in a really long time. The first quad-core CPU to occupy that segment was the uh, Q9200, and that launched way back in 2008, I believe, 2007 or 8. I'll go ahead and put the correction right below here. But that's a really long time for a 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU to occupy the same space. That is no longer the case here. Ryzen has gone ahead and kicked that aside and replaced it with a 6-core, 12-thread CPU. Will match a 6800K, which costs over $400. Now getting back on track, the benchmarks, like I said, I'm not going to jump too much into them because they're all over the place. Not only are certain games missing from certain websites that they did benchmark with the uh, R7 CPUs, but the benchmarks are completely inconsistent. Obviously, each website is going to go ahead and use their own test bench, and they're going to go ahead and use their own uh, parts of the game that they do test for benchmarking. So, of course, some variation is to be expected. But, considering most of the websites, aside from uh, TechSpot, they all ran a GTX 1080. They all ran 16 gigabytes of 32 megahertz RAM. And I went ahead and just kind of looked at the stock settings, stock versus stock. So I ignored the overclock settings. When I was reading through these benchmarks, I noticed extreme variation in the frame rates. Now, averages generally seem to be pretty comparable across the board, but the minimum frame rates that each website was reporting were astronomically different. For example, I'm going to throw up a little chart here that I compiled. You can see in Battlefield 1, Gamers Nexus reports a minimum frame rate of 66.3 frames per second. Tech Power Up reported 57.5. That's a stark difference. And then, of course, TechSpot has 136. Now, the reason why TechSpot's is much higher is, could be because they're using a Titan XP and the other websites are using a GTX 1080. Okay, that would kind of make some sense, except for the fact that we're trying to test CPU limitations here. If the minimum frame rate's affected that much by the graphics card, therefore this is not a very good test because it is not CPU limited, and the CPU is obviously not going to be the bottleneck here. So that completely invalidates Gamer Nexus's point and uh, Tech Power Up's point. If you're not using the Titan XP and you're GPU limited, you would either need to lower your resolution or 
settings or something because you are now just being GPU bottlenecked. And I find that very interesting. There's a couple other benchmarks that I found that were extremely interesting. And oddly enough, most of them I found on Tech Power Up's website. It seems that most of the other websites, they decided not to go ahead and continue to uh, benchmark a lot of different games. Tech Power Up does tons and tons of different games. But this right here, this minimum frame rate chart, shows the Ryzen CPUs, all of them, absolutely dominating in Rise of the Tomb Raider. However, if we go and switch to uh, a non-text minimum frame rates, it seems the i5-7600K is more than adequate at keeping up. And this really kind of just led me to the realization that without some sort of standardized testing across the board that everybody has to adhere to, there's really no way to really trust all of these. Some websites are going to say that Intel's a lot faster, and some websites are saying that AMD's a lot faster. And for the most part, that just means to me that these benchmarks, for the most part, are just kind of like guidelines. Overall, it's not to say that any of them are wrong, it's just because everybody's doing something differently and with some different configurations, and they're just testing it the way that they want to, it's not an apples to apples comparison, even though it's the same, supposedly the same game on the same hardware, it obviously does not work out that way. So these benchmarks right here, I'm not gonna go into any more detail because they're just all over the place and in all honesty, they don't really matter. We're just gonna have to look at the hardware for what it is and make informed decisions based upon that. Now I haven't spoken too much about Ryzen since it's released and my opinions on that and a bunch of you guys have been asking me for that and honestly I wanted to wait until the 1600 and 1600 X came out because I kind of figured it was going to be a game changer and in all honesty it really really is. Compared to the i5 7600K or the 7500 which are kind of in the same price points the Ryzen CPU is a no-brainer. Uh, most of the reviewers out there even if their website was showing much lower uh, gaming performance were still in the same boat and in agreement that the R5 just completely dominates the i5s. Now, the R5, 1600X, and 1600 are actually more in the league of the 7700K, which costs about $70 to $100 more. Now, if we just look at things objectively here, because obviously we can't take these benchmarks at face value, like I said, not that they're wrong, just that they're so contradictory to each other, it's hard to believe or understand who's actually correct here. So we're taking all this information, and in all honesty, if you throw it all together, it just doesn't look right. The R5 1600 and 1600X have 50% more cores and threads compared to the 7700K. Okay, so we have a 50% overall theoretical horsepower boost on that CPU. There is 50% more power in that CPU. Now what Intel has going for it is the higher IPC and higher clock speeds of the 7700K. The 7700K can easily reach about 5 gigahertz versus the 4 gigahertz on the 1600X. So we're looking at a 25% gain in clock frequency and then the Cavity Lake architecture versus Ryzen, which is basically equivalent to Broadwell, is about 10% faster there. So we're looking at 35% available from Intel from clock speed increase and IPC increase. So of that 50%, Intel can still overtake about 35% of that. So these CPUs overall horsepower wise are really close together. Now in games, games are designed for four cores. i5s have kind of been the mainstream standard for so long that four cores has been kind of what everybody's targeted. Now to get better performance, and because the consoles are 8-core chips, 8-threaded gaming has become pretty prevalent since 2015. So this is the reason why i7s are doing much better in modern games over i5s. Now being able to manage all that extra code that the games are putting out there more efficiently with the hyper-threading, the i7s generally will have much higher minimum frame rates, and usually the average will be about the same, but generally will produce a much more fluid and less juttery experience. This is something that I spoke about in my CPU showdown series, uh, pretty much videos one through three. That's pretty much all I was trying to prove. Ironically enough, if you go read the comments in those videos, everybody was calling me an idiot saying an i5 was perfectly fine and pairing it with, you know, like a, a GTX 1070 was a perfectly good idea. Okay, I think we learned our lesson on that one, guys. Regardless, 
the i5s are kind of out the window and Intel still has that major advantage and that's the reason why they will continue to win games until the mid-range segment with six cores and 12 threads perhaps becomes a little bit more mainstream. Game developers will still target i5s as kind of the baseline as that's been the standard for a while now. That's why with the newer optimizations to games like Battlefield 1 where the 6900K actually beat the crap out of the 7700K, the 7700K now is far more powerful with its higher clock speeds. Games are being more optimized for quad cores even to this day. So let's just move on to my recommendations here because it's pretty cut and dry right now. If you're one of those people running an Asus 240Hz monitor and need the absolute fastest frame rate, no matter what, you will upgrade whenever your CPU is not the fastest, whenever your system starts slowing down, um, you're that type of person that's buying the Titan XPP or running 1080 Ti's and SLI, and you don't really care and you need the maximum absolute highest frame rates possible no matter what, buy a 7700K. Even compared to Intel's $1,000 and $1,500 processors, it kicks the shit out of them in gaming right now. Every game from today on back, it is number one. Now, if you are somebody who's like, okay, I want to build a platform and I want it to last as long as humanly possible. I, I want to go five to seven years with this platform. In all honesty, I'm going to recommend Intel one more time, and I'm going to recommend the X99 platform. And it's not for the reason that you're probably thinking. It's because you can go ahead and get like a 6800K now, which isn't completely unreasonable in price. I mean, well, right now it is. Last week it, it was kind of okay. But anyways, um, but it's still at least not $1,000 for a CPU. You can do that, um, and then in the future, when more cores become more prevalent, when you do need more than six cores, you can upgrade to an old Xeon processor that some companies are just trying to dump and recover some money off of. That's what's really nice about the High Enthusiast platform is it's compatible with Xeon chips, and you can get really high core count CPUs for dirt cheap. Sure, it's going to be four or five years down the road, but that's going to happen sooner or later once those CPUs become invalidated and upgraded from companies like Facebook and Google and whatever. They sell them dirt cheap just to get them gone. And honestly, that platform will last a really long time because of that. Now, the Ryzen Naples platform may be kind of in the same ballpark. We, we just don't know yet. We'll have to see how that all pans out. But traditionally, that's what happens with the Intel high-end platforms. Now, for the 99% of you out there that want to have something that games well today and will continue to grow with you through at least three or four more GPU upgrades, which you got to figure year, year and a half on a GPU cycle, the Ryzen 1600 and 1600X are definitely a great way to go. Is the Ryzen architecture perfect? No, it didn't quite live up to the expectations that we had for it. It performs very well in productivity software, and that performance didn't quite translate over to games the way that we had hoped. Now, if we look back at the Intel Core series, you know, the first generation, those CPUs did not clock much higher than 4 gigahertz, and they had issues scaling to memory speeds much over... Actually, I couldn't get mine over 1300 megahertz with an overclock. So these CPUs, these are kind of the first generation. They're good, but they're not great. You know, they, they don't take all the boxes that we were hoping that they would, but they tick enough to where they really just blow away the i5s and are still a superior value compared to the uh, mainstream i7 7700K. So you can save 100 bucks and technically have a little bit more performance overall in your CPU. But like I said, compared to Intel's first core series CPUs, they're having kind of a similar growing pains. So I guarantee you with the AM4 platform, you can invest $200 now. By the way, I suggest the 1600 over the 1600X unless you don't overclock. If you don't overclock, get the 1600X. It's worth the 30 bucks. But if you're okay with overclocking, go with the 1600. Now the performance of a six core over any quad core CPU is really good if you have many things going on at any given time. Not even many things, just simple things like Windows updates going on in your background, maybe an antivirus, maybe you're just downloading some stuff, playing some uh, music, or you have Skype. Having those extra cores there to handle those tasks while four cores and eight threads are playing your games 
It'll have enough performance to do those tasks simultaneously and just deliver a much smoother experience. This is something that all the reviewers have noted. The Ryzen CPUs compared to their Intel counterparts, you know, priced for price, are generally delivering a much smoother and overall more enjoyable gaming experience, even if the frame rates happen to be a little bit lower right now. Also, as games become more demanding and will eventually scale to cores because CPUs are not getting much faster. We've been at four and five, between four and five gigahertz pretty much since Sandy Bridge. That's 2011, guys. IPC is only going up a few percentage points per year. GPUs are gaining 30 to 50 percent every 18 months. So they're completely outpacing CPUs. So the only way to go around this is more cores. So honestly, you're more future proof with the Ryzen CPU. And for the most people out there, this is going to be the best bang for the buck. You can get an inexpensive platform that you can grow with that has more performance that you're not tapping into right now at only $200 to $250, which give it a few weeks. I guarantee you the 1600s, you'll be able to find them on slick deals for about 200 bucks. And there you go. So guys, that's pretty much my take right there. For the majority of people, this is great news. You're going to get a significant performance increase at a very, very affordable price. And for those people out there demanding the absolute best, well, they understand that they're going to pay a lot more money with diminishing returns. And maybe in the future they'll pay off. Or some people upgrade constantly to always have the fastest. That's okay too. I've been there. I, I don't do that quite as much as I used to. But I understand that. You know, anytime a new faster processor is about to come out, you sell what you have and then you buy that. Okay, I mean, that's an option as well. But for most people who want to buy a platform, just kind of stick with it. The Ryzen R5 1600 or 1600X, definitely the way to go. Alrighty guys, if you like this kind of video, please hit that like button. Please leave some comments below and please share it with friends. That really helps us out. And I will catch you guys in the next video.